Good day. Welcome to our fifth webinar training series and second for this year. I hope you all are doing fine and being health these days. Vaccination process is on its way and we expect to for a better day soon. For today, we have a different uh, webinar training. It's not exactly related to Breakbook or Have Lift, but it's for sure a, a light to explore new ways on this new digital format. So I would like to invite our marketing manager, Elizabeth Cosmatos, to better introduce our special guest uh, for today. Thank you. Hello. Hello, uh, the HLG team. It's uh, very nice to see you all here. Thank you for taking the time to join yet another webinar, yet another digital event. It is true that uh, we all face long screen hours, so we truly appreciate your presence uh, here today. Um, allow me to welcome our speaker, uh, Mr. Peter Economides, who is going to introduce to us a different mindset by explaining the key features of business development during the challenging times that we experience nowadays. Peter, welcome to THLG. It's a privilege to have you with us. Uh, before you take over, allow me to share a quick personal experience and explain how all this started. Uh, I, I met Peter for the first time um, about three years ago in uh, Thessaloniki during a conference. He was one of the panel speakers. His speech was uh, so inspiring that uh, boosted my self-confidence and opened new horizons by giving ideas for development. His words generated possibilities that I hadn't realized before. And most importantly, I left that evening with a gut feeling that change can happen. It can be done. So uh, let's see who uh, is Peter Economides. Uh, if Andreas can start sharing uh, the screen. Of course, hello. Give me one moment, please. Can you all see it? Yeah, let's uh, okay, move great. forward. Okay, so who is Peter Economides? Uh, uh, a highly experienced global marketing and communications uh, specialist uh, and uh, worked for some of the uh, world's major uh, brands, which uh, include Absolute, Apple, uh, Shiva, Citibank, Coca-Cola, and many more. started his career in uh, the 90s uh, and have, uh, as I see, lived in many, many uh, places and uh, different continents. He is now back in Greece, uh, where he founded his uh, own company named Felix uh, B&I uh, in uh, 2003. So uh, that's in a nutshell. Oh, okay, sorry, uh, there is more there. Uh, and uh, Peter has received a Lifetime Achievement Award from uh, the Hellenic Council of America. And at the same time, his work uh, was recognized by the US Congress. In, 19, in 2018, the International Propeller Club of the United States honored him with a Member's Award of Excellence. So uh, this is Peter in a nutshell, but I'm sure he will uh, be saying much more. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's to you now, Peter. Thank you very much. We all look forward to hearing you. We are all ears. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. I really, I love being here. It's great to be here. I just want to quickly share my screen. Can you see a cow kind of like leaning forward? <laughs> Yes, I'm sure you can. So there you go. Hello. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've prepared um, a full deck of slides. There's a lot of stuff that I want to share with you. Um, what I suggest is the following. As I go through this, if anybody's got a question at any point, just hit down at the bottom and put your hand up and I will stop and, and we can actually deal with any questions as we go through this. I'd like to make it as interactive as we possibly can which is not always easy on this format, which we're all getting used to slowly, yes? So um, once again, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to today. 
So let me just start with this over here. This over here is Philip Kotler. Whoever has studied marketing will surely have had Philip Kotler's book as his textbook. And what Philip Kotler says is the art of marketing is the art of brand building. If you're not a brand, you are a commodity. And I think that's absolutely right. That at the heart of marketing really is this art of brand building. It's really, really the key to a lot of things. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But first of all, what is brand? Let me just analyze this term a bit. Brand is your reputation. It's as simple as that. Brand is your reputation. It's what people think of you. The difficult thing is what they say about you when you're not in the room. They normally say things about you behind your back. But that's exactly what brand is all about. It's as simple as that. Everything communicates. Brand today, especially today, is what brand does. It's not what you say you are. It's who you really are. It's what you do. Everything communicates what you say, what you don't say, what you do, and what you don't do. What everyone in your organization says and does, and this is what makes it difficult. Every single time that anybody inside your organization interacts with a customer or interacts with the media where what they say is amplified in the media, they are forming your reputation, they're forming your brand. I want to give you a dramatic example of this. I woke up one morning, I travel a lot normally, not these days of course. I woke up early one morning, I looked at my alarm clock, it said 6.30 and suddenly I realized with a horror that I had an aeroplane at 7.30 and I started rushing to get dressed and I realized there was no way I was going to make this plane. And I sat down on the bed feeling really, really very depressed and I knew what I had to do. I had to phone the airport to explain to somebody what had happened and to try to find a solution. And I picked up the telephone and somebody came on the line. And the first thing she said to me was, I know exactly how you feel. Magic words. I know exactly how you feel. The next thing she said just blew my mind away. She said, go back to bed, go back to sleep. I will wake you up in two hours time with a solution. And I couldn't believe it. This was a wonderful lady called Patricia who works for KLM. And what she did in two minutes on the telephone is worth millions of dollars of advertising. It was remarkable. I know exactly how you feel. And I think this really illustrates this point that behavior is a direct reflection of culture, of values, of belief system. And Peter Drucker says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I agree completely. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Change. We live in a time of rapid change. The stream of change just keeps happening. And I think that one thing is true that, whoops, I've just Uh, can you guys hear me? Because my, I've had a bit of a technical issue over here. My screen has completely disappeared. I what think I'm going to have to... You can hear me, yeah? I think what I'm going to have to do is to get out and rejoin. So please give me a second. I'll be back with you. My apologies for that.
Hello, Kyriakos. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, Parlo. Nice room, eh, Parlo? <laughs> are you reading a lot, I think? It's your home or your office? Unmute. Sorry. Can you guys see my screen? Because I can't see a yes. thing here. We can see you, Peter. This is really strange. I cannot see a thing. It's the first time it's happened. Do you have Andreas? Andreas, uh, is uh, the room or let me see. Hello, Mr. Economides. How are you? Oh, Hi, okay. Andreas. I don't know what has happened, but I've never seen this before. I cannot see my screen. Yeah, we can I, see I, your I screen, see but... We, uh, we can see your screen. You're just uh, uh, browsing through some icons at the bottom of your screen. Uh, may I suggest that uh, you do a restart of the computer? Maybe? Ah, maybe I see what's happened. The application. Right. Yes, I got it. I got it. Okay, great. I got it. I'm back. Okay. I understand what happened. We have a suggestion to uh, hit Alt. Alt and Tab to go to the next document. Okay, but I think Hold on a second, because the yeah, application yeah. cracked. Uh, the application crashed. Give me one second. I will be with you. I know exactly what happened here. Yeah. To be honest, Peter, I'm happy that we have uh, this issue because uh, it shows real life. Uh, otherwise, ah, it's only uh, like a <laughs> presentation only. Yeah, I nice. Know. So we see. Can you see it back, back again? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. All right. My apologies for that, guys. No problem. So I was here. Change. That's what I was talking about. So there we go. Change. So I was saying that we live on this constant stream of change, which never, ever stops. And standing still in today's world is the fastest way of moving backward. And I think that's absolutely true. And that's true about technology as well. Standing still is the fastest way of moving backward. And I remind you about human behavior, which is probably the most important change that we've got to be careful of. There's a whole generation out there who are digital natives. We're all digital nomads. Standing still is the fastest way of moving backward. So technology, skills, we, there's a lot of talk about technology transformation, about skill transformation, but I think the most important thing that we need is mindset transformation, which means cultural transformation. And that's really, really what I want to focus on today. One thing I just want to deal with very quickly is the what I call the B2B fallacy. We've all heard of B2B. B2C, which is business to consumer marketing, and we've heard of B2B, and somehow we've come to believe that B2B is different to B2C. I reject that absolutely. All kinds of marketing is P2P marketing. It's person to person, and marketing and branding must be intensely focused on people. And that's really the central message that I really want to get through today. The key is to really be focused on people. Marketing. Marketing the new normal. First of all, a word about brand strategy, what it's really all about. I see brand strategy as a bridge. It's a narrative bridge which connects the past with the present and the future. It's a bridge which allows the organization to travel from where it's been and where it is to where it wants to be. The brand model that I use very quickly to put that into perspective as well. The first thing that I look at is ambition. And by the way, when I work on brand, I work very closely with the organization as client. These are the questions that I'm asking inside the organization. What's the ambition? I'm looking for the essential DNA of the organization. That, if you like, are the two sides of the bridge, future vision and DNA. And I'm looking for market insight. And where these three things come together, in the middle, 
is the sweet spot. And anybody who plays tennis knows exactly what I'm talking about. When you find your strategic sweet spot, every time you hit the ball, it goes exactly where you want it to go. And it feels good inside your hand. That's what we're looking for, is the strategic sweet spot. Once we've got that, what I look for is the manifesto, which is an expression of purpose and values. And coming out of that are the organizational behaviors. So that you get vision matching up to reality, the two different sides of that bridge that I spoke about. And where those come together, what you've got is growth and sustainable growth. So that's really what strategy is all about for me. Marketing the new normal. We live today under the volcano. We used to talk about disruptive change. I think it's far more accurate today to talk about eruption. Change just happens underneath our feet. And if you don't react to it, you've got a huge problem. Change erupts, literally erupts. Technology erupts. And now this, who was expecting COVID? This just erupted on us. All of a sudden we're dealing with this. It's been around for a year already. And by the way, technology and of course COVID affects human behavior, which is ultimately what it's all about. The new normal, I think this is the new normal. Change erupts, that's the new normal. That's the new normal. I have no idea what comes after COVID. I am pretty sure we don't return back to the way we were. We've already changed. I'm sure about that. Get used to it. If you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance even less. Marketing the new normal. Marketing the new normal needs a combination of two things, agility on the one hand and consistency on the other. And these two things are really conflicting with each other. But that's something Aristotle spoke about. 2000 years ago, Aristotle spoke about rhetoric. And here's what he said, that rhetoric consists of ethos, logos, pathos, Keros, and let me explain these four ideas. And all of these things together combine to, to, to create rhetoric, powerful rhetoric. Now I've taken Aristotle's model and I've turned that into brand rhetoric. And let me explain exactly what this is all about. Aristotle said that ethos is about purpose, it's about belief, it's about values, it's about character, it's about who you are. Logos is about what you do and don't do, what you say and don't say. Pathos is what we're all looking for, is a powerful emotional reaction. Keros is about timeliness, about doing things at the right time, which we all know is terribly important. So on the left hand side, you've got consistency. Top right hand side, you've got agility. Bottom left hand side, you've got emotional connection. Timeliness, you've got relevance. And when those four things come together, you've got very powerful brand rhetoric. Consistency, agility, emotional connection and relevance. Marketing the new normal. Let me tell you quickly about myself. Um, I was born in South Africa. It's tough growing up in South Africa with a name like Economides. Nobody can pronounce it. With a name like mine, I landed up studying economics. That shouldn't surprise anybody. But I really found myself with marketing. I always wanted to be a big deal in New York. That was my dream. I said to myself, I want to become a big deal on Madison Avenue. I started in South Africa working for Pepsi Cola. I then joined McCann Erickson, a very big global um, advertising agency. They moved me to Hong Kong. I spent two years working in Hong Kong. One day I got a call from somebody in New York and he said to me, you're Greek, aren't you? I said, yes. He says, uh, do you speak Greek? I said, fluently. I couldn't speak a word. 
and they sent me to Athens as the CEO of McCann Erickson here in Greece. I then moved to Mexico, which I loved. I spent four years there as the CEO of McCann Erickson Mexico, very large ad agency within the group and the largest advertising agency in Mexico. And finally, I made it to New York and I became a big deal on Madison Avenue. I moved to New York as executive vice president, worldwide um, director of client services for McCann Erickson. And I was specifically responsible for the Coca-Cola global advertising account. This was my client, a Mexican called Sergio Zeman, very famous guy, we used to call him the Ayacola. He was a very difficult man, but he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I felt very, very privileged to work for him. I learned a lot from Mexico City, Sergio Zeman. I then moved to another ad agency called TBWA, TBWA Worldwide in New York, very famous for its work on Absolute Vodka, Sony PlayStation, Nissan, all sorts of clients like that. And there I got to work with this person, Steve Jobs at Apple. And I'll talk about that because there are a lot of lessons about brand out of my experience with, uh, with Apple. I'll talk about that in a while. I then decided to leave the corporate world and I moved back to Greece and I established my own company here called Felix BNI. And I live in Greece, but I work around the world. Um, some of my clients have included Coca-Cola, Heineken, um, American Express, all sorts of clients all over the world. In the logistics industry, I have done a lot of work in the shipping industry. I've spoken at the Limassol Shipping Chamber, at the Swedish Club, in Tanko, at Gard, in Arendal, in, in Norway, Lloyd's, the Vancouver International Maritime Center, the Marine Club of Piraeus, and the Propeller Club of the United States. I want to share some of the work I've done in shipping because I think it's quite interesting for you guys. It reflects my belief that at the end of the day, it comes down to people. And here's a statement which I think is true. People think about shopping. They don't think about shipping. And I think that's absolutely true. But without shipping, there is no shopping because 90% of the world's trade comes by ship. Without shipping, there is no shopping. And I want to show you this video that I produced for the shipping industry. I'm just going to change the settings on my share. Please give me one second. Excuse me for one second while I do this. Yep, that's fine. You can see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to presume that you can.
Okay, I have I have shown that video to many people inside the shipping industry and the reaction I get every time is the same. It's a very powerful reaction. And I think it demonstrates my basic belief that we have to put everything at the end of the day in universal human terms because universal human terms are powerful. People relate to them. And I think the message inside that video is a very strong message that without ships, there is no world trade. But more importantly, without ships, there is no BMW. There is no sugar in your coffee. It's, it's, I think it's the way to communicate is to become incredibly uh, individual and human. So back to my point, under the volcano. My industry has been as much hit by technology as any other. This over here is from a speech that I gave in Mexico City in 1994. And this is what I said. Massive media, not mass media. I'll watch what I want, when I want. The rise of a new individualism. The future, one place, Earth. No more target markets, individuals, targets. Dear John, do you really want a 30 second spot on network television? That was back in 1994, long before Facebook arrived, long before that. Fast forward, fast forward to today. Television is not working today. What I said in 1994 was absolutely right. There's no signal on television. Today, look at this. The smartphone is an indispensable companion. This is research done amongst millennials in the United States by the Bank of America. Uh, and these are young millennials aged 18 to 24. And the question is, what's the most important thing in your life? Number one, the smartphone, 96%. Number two, the toothbrush. Number three, deodorant the internet, laptop, a car, social networks, TV and coffee. So we've got smelly connected people is the basic conclusion out of this. But this is true. The smartphone is an indispensable companion. This is the new TV. This is where we get our information these days. And in this world, you're no longer who you say you are. You are who others say you are and who they tell each other you are. I want to give you an example of this. Ten years ago, this fellow over here, Dave Carroll, I've met him by the way, very nice guy. Dave Carroll was a second-rate country and western singer in the United States. Okay, He traveled on United Airlines and they broke his guitar and he put in a claim for $3,200 for them to replace his guitar. After six months, United Airlines said to him, no, we're not going to pay because it wasn't our fault. So what does Dave Carroll do? He makes a song about it and he puts it up on YouTube. Have a look at this. I flew United Airlines on my way to Nebraska. The plane departed Halifax, connecting in Chicago's old air. While on the ground, a passenger said from the seat behind me, My God, they're throwing guitars out there. The band and I exchanged a look, best described as terror, at the action on the tarmac, and knowing whose projectiles these would be. So before I left Chicago, I alerted three employees who showed complete indifference towards me. United, United, you broke my Taylor guitar. United. Just admit it, I should 
should have flown with someone else or gone by car. Cause United breaks guitars. By the way, quick question. Can you guys hear the sound on the videos okay? Yes, we can hear. Okay, excellent. So, United breaks guitars. I should have flown with someone else or gone by car. That's, that's unbelievable stuff. This video, he put it onto YouTube and within a week, it got 20 million views. It was picked up by CNN, by CBS, by NBC, ABC. It became the number one country and Western song on iTunes. And he published a book on Amazon called United Breaks Guitars, the power of one voice in the age of social media. And this is what happens. Within four days of the song going online, the gathering thunderclouds of bad PR caused United Airlines stock price to suffer a mid-flight stall and it plunged by 10%, costing shareholders $180 million, which incidentally would have bought Carol more than 51,000 replacement guitars. Unbelievable. And this is what United says about themselves, fly the friendly skies. Now, they didn't learn their lesson because two years ago, something else happened. This passenger was dragged off a United Airlines flight, which was overbooked. They dragged him off. They forgot that there were people on that plane with cell phones who were taking videos of this and putting it up on social media. Just take a look at this little video. I mean, that is, that is just unbelievable. And you've got an airline saying, fly the friendly skies, and they kind of forget that, you know, in today's world, if you did that 10 years ago, there'd be maybe 300 people on the plane who would see it 20 years ago, who would see it. Well, today it's not like that. This time, the share price dropped by 1.8 billion within a week. Unbelievable stuff, unbelievable stuff. Now, this is what the American Marketing Association says about brand. It says brand is a name, a term, a design, a symbol, or any other feature that identifies one seller's goods or service as distinct from those of other sellers. And that's the American Marketing Association. So what they're talking about is that brand, the way that I would brand my cattle to distinguish my cattle from
from your cattle. In fact, the word brand comes from the German word brand, which is to burn, fire. Okay, that's exactly the origins of the word brand. In other words, they're talking about almost like a tattoo. Well, I think that's absolute rubbish. That over there is a logo. This is a brand. Angelina Jolie. She's not the world's best actress, and I don't really care what tattoo she's got on her arm. But when the G20 meet, guess who's there? Angelina Jolie. When the United Nations go to Africa, Angelina Jolie is there. She doesn't need the United Nations. She's got her own. She's adopted kids from all over the world. But when this person has a mastectomy, she's on the front cover of Time magazine. She is one hell of a brand. Lumix. A lot of people will tell you this is the world's best digital camera. It's made by Panasonic in Japan. It's got a Leica lens and a lot of people think it's the world's best. Costs around 500 pounds, euros, dollars, depending on where you buy it. Other people will tell you that's the world's best digital camera. It's a Leica. Obviously, that's got a Leica lens as well, and that costs $800, pounds, or euros, depending on where you buy it. Now, Wallpaper magazine says there's little need to disguise our burning passion for all things Leica. What's good enough for top photographers is certainly good enough for us too. Gizmodo says they are made in the same factory. They have the same sensor, lens, LCD, housing material, embedded software, battery and battery charger. Both take identical pictures. Yet the Leica is often described as taking warmer, smoother, some are better pictures than the Lumix, which would be amazing given the technology is identical. And indeed, these two cameras are absolutely identical. Both are made by Panasonic in Japan. Leica is made under license. So they're the two cameras. The only difference is the signature on the front. Otherwise, they are exactly the same. I've got the Leica. $300 is not a bad price to pay to get that badge hanging around your neck. A brand is nothing more than a set of impressions that lives in consumers' minds. That's called share of mind in marketing terms. And share of mind inevitably becomes share of pocket. Everything communicates. I said this earlier. What you say and don't say and what you do and don't do. The best brands are protagonists. They represent the category, just like Absolute Vodka, which is a generic white spirit from Sweden, came to represent the vodka category. It should be the ambition of every brand to be the protagonist of their category. Indeed, that's the case with Coca-Cola. No matter where I go around the world, if I ask people to name a soft drink for me, they're going to say Coca-Cola. So I have a question for you. What's the Coca-Cola of cigarettes? That's a question, by the way. Marlboro. Marlboro. The Marlboro of sports shoes. Nike. 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 The Nike of beers. That's a tricky one. Yeah. Heineken? I think it's Heineken. Heineken. A lot of people might say Budweiser to you, but that's a very American kind of answer. And it might even be one of the Mexican beers, but I think that globally it's Heineken. The Heineken of coffee shops? Starbucks. Starbucks, that's easy. The Starbucks of German luxury cars. Porsche. Any others? 
Yeah, BMW or Mercedes? Mercedes Benz, I would say. The Mercedes Benz of search engines? <laughs> That's easy. That's easy. The Google of computers? Apple. 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 The Apple of specialized heavy transport companies? Oh. They have lift group, of course. Of course. What a question. What a question. Growth. Growth comes from vision and reality captured in a manifesto of purpose, values, and reflected in behaviors. I've got, uh, I, can hear, I can hear a telephone conversation in the background. Yeah, um, Andreas, can you please support us to find, to, I think, to mute uh, all the... Of course, one moment, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the Apple story because it's quite fascinating. 1997, the whole world was saying that Apple was dead. He has a statement from the chief technical officer of Microsoft. And Apple indeed was, was bankrupt because Windows had caught up with Apple in terms of technology. The, the Microsoft Windows operating system was pretty good. And there was no real reason for Apple to exist anymore. The machines were just expensive and slow. So Steve Jobs went back to Apple in August, July, in fact, of 1997. In 2018, Apple becomes the first company to top $1 trillion in value. And by the way, five years earlier than that, it had become the world's most valuable company ever in 2013. And in 2020, Apple is now worth $2 trillion from bankruptcy. Now, I happened to be in New York at the time working for TBWA. Our Los Angeles office uh, had been approached by Apple, and I flew out to Cupertino to have a meeting with Steve Jobs to convince him that TBWA was the right agency to manage the global relaunch of Apple. I had a four hour conversation with Steve, and here's some of the stuff that he said to me. Let's make a dent on the universe. He didn't say to me, let's turn around this bankrupt company. He didn't say, let's sell more computers. He said, let's make a dent on the universe. Second thing, let's do insanely great things. Third thing, good enough is not enough. And the fourth thing, Technology should be like a bicycle for the mind. When you see it, you should understand exactly what it, is, what it is and you never forget how to use it. So back to vision and reality. Here's the stuff I heard. Let's make a dent on the universe, vision. Technology should be like a bicycle for the mind. Let's do insanely great things. Good enough is not enough. I got back to New York and I sent an email to Steve Jobs. And that's what I said to him. Dear Steve, the world needs Apple. He convinced me. Best regards, Peter. We produced the Think Different commercial, which I'm guessing that a lot of you have already seen. But this is the Think Different commercial. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. 
because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. I'd like you to note a few things about that piece of communication. The word computer does not appear once and there's not a single photograph of a computer. It's all about culture. It's all about mindset. It's all about vision. It's all about behavior. It's all about values. And here's what it says. By the way, we had Maria Callas in that commercial. We couldn't resist putting a Greek person into it. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Now, this kind of culture was reflected in everything that Apple did. Design and technology, architecture, this is the store in New York. Through people, this is the genius bar where you can go up and ask any question you like about Apple computers and Apple equipment and get answers. Through community, these are seminars held in the Apple stores where they teach you about Apple products and Apple software and how to do things on Apple machines. Through everything that Apple does. And here's the result. People lining up to be the first to get the new iPhone. By the way, this is London, so predictably it was raining. So you've got Apple umbrellas being provided to people who are waiting outside. That's the Regent Street store, by the way. And here's a photograph of a guy who has just managed to get the new iPhone. He's just given Apple 500 or $600, whatever it is, to have the new iPhone. And he goes home and he makes an unboxing video and he gets 12 and a half million views. So what all of this creates is a human connection. And I want to emphasize that a human connection, it creates loyalty. It creates the conditions for sustainable growth. And what that leads to is multiple transactions over time. I've got every one of those machines and I can't wait for the next one to come out. And it leads to multiple transactions across categories. iMac, I've got an iPod, I use iTunes, I've got an iPhone, I use the App Store, I've got an iPad, I've got a MacBook, I use iCloud, I've got an Apple TV, I've got an Apple Watch, here it is. I use Apple Pay, I've got a HomePod, and if they launch a refrigerator, I'm buying it tomorrow. And if they launch a car, we'll all go and see it. Now, I want to emphasize something. I'm talking about B to C. Humans are humans. The same thinking applies to B to B. There is no difference between B to B and B to C, and I insist on that. It needs a focus on humanity, on what people are all about. So here you've got it. There's the megaphone, which is the manifesto that I played you in that video. And here's what Apple does according to that manifesto. All that stuff. In other words, it gets back to Aristotle. There's consistency and there's agility because today's world of change needs agility. But building a powerful reputation needs consistency. So that's how the two come together. Your work is a megaphone for what you believe. Back to brand rhetoric. Consistency, agility, emotional connection. You saw it with the guy who just bought his iPhone. Relevance, for example, the iPod. Great consumer relevance. So what you've got is ethos, logos, 
pasos and keros. Brand rhetoric. Aristotle said it all. And that's the result. Apple is now worth two trillion dollars, making it the most valuable company in the world. Let's just talk about vision very quickly. Let's make a dent on the universe. That's a massive vision. It's what we call a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal, a gorilla. And that's something which Jim Collins wrote about in his book called Built to Last. And I want to read this to you because it's interesting. The power of the BHAG is that it gets you out of thinking too small. A great BHAG changes the time frame and simultaneously creates a sense of urgency. It's a real paradox. So on the one hand, you're not going to get a BHAG done in three years. You're not going to get it done in five years. A really good BHAG probably has a minimum length of about a decade, and many take longer than that. So that so time frames extend to where you're no longer managing for the quarter, but for the quarter century. On the other hand, because it's so big and so audacious and so hairy, it increases the sense of urgency. You look at it and say, oh my goodness, if we're going to deal with climate change or transform education or put a computer on every desk, then we have to get to work today with a level of intensity that is unrelenting. Because the only way you can achieve something that big is an absolutely obsessed, monomaniacal, overwhelming intensity and focus that starts today and goes tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day for 365 days and then for 3,650 days. That's how you do it. And here's the irony. It creates patience, but at the same time, impatience. And I think that's the magic of having a really big goal. By the way, I was chairman of Make-A-Wish International for a number of years. We were granting a huge number of wishes and we made the calculations and we discovered that there were 2 million young kids on the planet who were suffering from life-threatening medical conditions. And we were only granting the, the wishes of 200,000 kids. When we kind of like spoke about that and made it our objective to get to 2 million wishes every year, all of a sudden the wishes jumped up from 200,000 to 250,000 in, in a matter of a couple of months. It's a very powerful thing to have a really big goal. Purpose and values. I don't know if you've heard of this guy called Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek gave a talk on TEDx a couple of years ago, where he speaks about the golden circle. And he says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I'd like to explain this to you. I think it's worth it. This is the golden circle. At the bottom is what? And Simon Sinek says, everybody knows what they do. Some people can explain how they do it. Very few can tell you why they do it. And why, he says, is the most important motivation. Start with why. I'm going to demonstrate this to you. That's me and my dog. I found this dog um, on the streets in Athens. He was tiny, five days old, I found him. I took him to the vet and the vet said to me, this dog will not survive. He was covered with fleas and his leg was broken. And I said, this dog will survive. And I found a diet for him, which consisted of milk, honey and eggs. And he grew into a very big dog. And the time came for me to put him onto solid food. Now, I must admit, I wanted the best food for my dog, but I've never tasted dog food and I had no intention of doing it. And all of a sudden, somebody says to me, everything we do is for the love of dogs. And they show me this video.
so I didn't have to taste the food. The best or nothing, Mercedes Benz. That's a why. And this I just love. This is Nike. Find your greatness. Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is only for the chosen few, for the superstars. The truth is, greatness is for us all. This is not about lowering expectations. It's about raising them for every last one of us. Greatness is not in one special place, and it's not in one special person. Greatness is wherever somebody is trying to find it. I just love that. Behaviors. Starbucks. The baristas who, wear, who work at Starbucks wear these aprons, you know that. And there's something written inside, which you can see over there. It does not say we make the world's best coffee, which is simply not true. What it says is the following. We create inspired moments in each customer's day. Anticipate, connect, personalize, own. It's a cultural reminder of behavior. And there's something else about Starbucks. That's how they trace your coffee and track whose coffee is whose. There are better ways to do it than writing it on, on the cup with a marker pen, but this is a way of establishing a connection with the customer. Excuse me, what's your name? Peter. Ah, you don't write it like that, you spell it like this. Ah, what a nice name. It's a chance to get involved in conversations. Customer obsession. This to me is probably the key to everything. Be obsessed with customers, not customer focus, customer obsession. The best example that I know of this is, by the way, this is Bezos saying the following, we're not competitor obsessed, we are customer obsessed. We start with the customer and work backwards. This is Avis, written in the 60s, by the way. I, I think it's genius. Avis needs you. You don't need Avis. Avis never forgets this. We're still a little hungry. We're only number two in rented cars. Customers aren't a dime a dozen to us. Sometimes when business is too good, they get the short end and aren't treated like customers anymore. Wouldn't you like the novel experience of walking up to a counter and not feel you're bothering somebody. Try it. Come to the Avis counter and rent a new Ford. Avis is only number two in rented cars, so we have to try harder to make our customers feel like customers. Our counters all have two sides, and we know which side our bread is buttered on. That was written in 1964. Behavior, behavior, the most important change is behavioral change because it affects humans and humans are the ones who make decisions about using our company or our group or not. And here's a huge change, the me, me, me generation. This is Time magazine writing about millennials some years ago. Millennials are lazy, entitled narcissists who still live with their parents. Let's just look at this generation because it's really important to understand them. By the way, these are people between the ages of 24 and 40. I bet a lot of people making decisions today about using your services fall somewhere in that age group. These are no longer the kids who are going to grow up to become adults. They are the new adults. And there are 2 billion of them worldwide. That makes them the world's largest demographic. And here's what Unilever says about them. We don't think of them as special or different anymore. They are the core of our business. This is how they think in a nutshell. People are curating and streamlining their lives. They don't just want more stuff. They want products and services that make their lives better. People want better and more connected experiences. And I think there's a lesson inside here for every single business. Welcome to the experience economy. Not too long ago, we were dealing in the commodity 
economy. We then became a product-driven economy, a brand-driven economy, recently, by the way, a service-driven economy, but lately we're becoming an experience-driven economy. Let me illustrate the difference. Commodity. That's a commodity. Coffee. Selling at approximately two euros a kilo, right, as a commodity. Here's coffee as a product being sold in a coffee shop, approximately eight euros a kilo. Here's coffee as a brand, Nescafe, approximately 28 to 30 euros a kilo. Here's coffee as a service, Nespresso, 124 euros per kilo. And finally, there's coffee as an experience. And that's quite a few hundred euros a kilo. So there's the difference. Commodity on the left-hand side, experience on the right-hand side. I want to give some examples, first of all, of experience. This over here comes from the healthcare business. It's a company called Afidea. Some of you may have heard about it. It's a diagnostic center, a global diagnostic center. I did some branding work for them a few years ago. The company used to be known as Euromedic. We changed the name to Afidea. Here's where the word comes from. Afidea, affinity with doctors and patients. Trust and fidelity in everything we do. Constant progress through ideas and innovation. Now, these are the values of the company. Affinity, fidelity, and ideas and innovation. Here's the manifesto. There is nothing more important than health. That's why people need health professionals who know what they're doing. And perhaps more importantly, who care about what they do. Patients trust and rely on their doctors. Doctors trust and rely on us. We cannot betray this, ever. Technology is doing more for health today than it has ever done before. And technology will do even more for health tomorrow. We strive to provide the best technology, today and tomorrow. We seek the best medical professionals. We develop them. And we establish the highest standards and procedures to ensure that we use technology safely, effectively and efficiently. We exchange best practice through our extensive global network and affiliations. We want to be the best at what we do, always. We care about how patients feel. That's why we make every visit as comfortable as we can. Patients deserve to know what we do, how we do it, and, most importantly, why we do it. We share our knowledge. We are passionate about health and compassionate towards people because nothing is more important than health. Very simple, with a truly universal message, nothing is more important than health. But the true breakthrough with Afida came through this thinking. We realized that we were dealing with a reluctant consumer. People don't feel excited about going to have a diagnostic checkup. They're afraid. They're not feeling very comfortable. It's not like going to buy an iPhone where you're excited about getting the newest iPhone. And yet people in healthcare facilities are treated not as well as they should be. Um, it's strange. And I remember saying to myself when I was working on this, why is it that when I go to a restaurant, the maitre d' welcomes me and makes me feel really good about being there, but I go to a healthcare facility and I'm treated as just a number. So we did something. <clears throat> we instituted something called the design project where we redesigned our clinics. This is a clinic in Setubal in Portugal, outside, outside Lisbon, 
in a shopping center, which is really beautiful. It makes you feel comfortable to be inside there. But the more important thing we did was this, the hospitality project. We got engaged with the hotel school in Lausanne, where they teach people how to become good restaurant maitre d's. And we developed a training program for our receptionists working in our health clinics around the world. The other example that I want to share with you is one about obsession. This is a client of mine called Ocean Co. Ocean Co produces super yachts. I'm talking about super yachts 100 meters and over, costing around 200 million um, a pop. And they're located in, in, uh, in Holland, in Rotterdam, Al Blasserdam, just outside Rotterdam. That's a, an Ocean Co boat, really beautiful. The mother of all luxury purchases. That's how Bernard Anor of LVMH calls the super yacht, the mother of all luxury purchases. And he's right, nothing comes close, absolutely nothing. The perfect yacht. We said to ourselves right at the beginning that our objective was to become the number one. We wanted the top three together with Lurson and Fedship. We wanted to become number one, the iconic brand within the industry. And it all happened through a basic, basic insight. I said to myself, why does an owner buy a yacht? And the only answer I could give myself was because he can. And out of that came the central creative idea. The perfect yacht can only be the perfect yacht when it is the owner's perfect yacht. And now the job was to create a culture where everybody working at Oceanco would focus on the owner's perfect yacht. It all starts here. With a vision. The owner's vision. Of how a yacht looks. How it feels. We listen. We design. We plan. We engineer. We build. Until every detail is exactly as it should be. Some things it seems cannot be done. Perhaps only because they have never been done before. It takes an open mind an innovative mind. A mind focused on the owner's vision. One mind working together so that me becomes we. Surpassing expectation to build the owner's perfect yacht. Only when we achieve this can we say, built by Ocean Co. You may have seen the DNA strand that's in the middle of that movie, when me becomes we, everything becomes possible. And by the way, that DNA strand contains a photograph of everybody at Ocean Co, including, by the way, the owner. There he is, Al Barwani. Now, what we did is we gave a poster to everybody working at Ocean Co, which had the DNA strand up at the top with the entire manifesto underneath it, but with their photograph highlighted as per this example over here. We had that DNA strand on every single computer as a screensaver. 
and we have these t-shirts printed which everybody wears the perfect yacht can only be the perfect yacht when it is the owner's perfect yacht and there's just one little statement no big statements about the company just one little statement built by ocean co today ocean co is regarded as being the number one builder in the world this is something I did for a group of naval architects. Um, the name as well, Lateral, is the name that I uh, created for them. And their logo, which is the nine square puzzle, if you know it, which forces you to think out of the box. And here's their manifesto. Engineering is a search for answers. Innovation is a new answer to an old question. Lateral is an answer to a new question. Ask new questions. This is something I did for wines produced on Mount Athos in northern Greece, the holy mountain as they call it, where all the monasteries are. Beautiful place. And it was all based on this idea, time. It takes time to get to Mount Athos, the sacred mountain. But as soon as you get there, you step back in time and you rediscover time. I went to visit the monastery and I wrote a manifesto while I was there. And that's the manifesto right there. It takes time to create this exceptional wine, a wine steeped in timeless monastic tradition, handcrafted in limited quantities with love and devotion by the monks of Hilandar, with grapes grown on vines dating back to the foundation of the holy monastery of Hilandar on the sacred mountain of Mount, of Mount Athos in 1198. I wrote that while I was at the monastery. It was an exceptional experience. And that's what the bottle looks like. So, change erupts. This is the new normal. And it's not over. After the millennials come the kids of the millennials. After this new leadership, this is a Time magazine from last year, Youthquake, how the world will change when a new generation leads. Digital printing, my question to you guys in the business that you're in, what happens when we start printing these huge things like this bridge in Paris for the 2024 Olympic Games? And my big question, what happens after COVID? Right now, that's what the world looks like. I'm not sure, but all of this is change. And this, we're digital migrants. He's a digital native. One thing I'm sure about, we need to be obsessed with human behavior from deep inside, because I'm sure of one thing. When you give more, you get more back in return. In fact, you get a lot more back in return. So I am sure about one thing, be completely obsessed with human behavior. And I want to leave you with this thought. This is Bill Gates. We overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and we underestimate the next 10. Don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. So back to my cow, which is where the word brand comes from. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful to be with you today. I would have preferred to do it physically in the same room so we could talk with each other and look at each other, but that's not happening these days. So thank you very much indeed for having me. Thank you, Peter. And I'm back with you. <laughs> yes, I found you. <laughs> Wine, let's try it. <laughs> very, uh, very nice. Thank you. It's been uh, very inspiring uh, to listen to you. Uh, I believe that you've shared a lot of things for us and uh, you did introduce us to a different uh, mindset maybe since uh, due to the pandemic the world has gone digital so this is the way to approach this is the way to approach uh, through videos through presentations in other words uh, and you also gave us the tools of doing it in the right way uh, by developing new strategies for approaching customers. So um, 
if I can bring it in, in a nutshell for, for us, for us non-marketeers <laughs> and uh, industry guys and logisticians and different, who are on different mindset, um, what we can do is to focus on the things that you said, like why we do it. Uh, listen to the customer needs and go backwards to shape our service strategy. The customer doesn't need us, but we do need the customer. So we never forget that. And that uh, people want uh, better and uh, more connected experiences. That's what I, I hear from you. Um, and also about the vision and vision about who you want to be the next day, what your brand will look like in the next day is how you shape it today. That's what I understood from the things you shared with us. Um, personally, I found it very helpful. It gives me direction. Maybe there are things that uh, some of the things are already known, but uh, when repeating things and when somebody gives you a different wording about it, maybe it's the one that clicks, you know, and uh, uh, puts you in the right direction to focus on the way you want to do your business. So thank you very much. It's been very inspiring and my privilege pleasure. to have you. Absolutely my pleasure. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that anybody might have or anything else. Please go ahead. I'd be very happy to do that. If I may say upon that, uh, clearly a technical issue, uh, everyone now has the uh, right to unmute themselves so they can ask whatever questions they wish. Just please, when you're done with your question or uh, with your conversation with Mr. Economides, just mute yourselves again so to avoid any noise or <laughs> confusion. That's from me. I see already... My apologies for the crash earlier. I was using an Apple computer, by the way. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Alessio, uh, I have unmuted you, so you yeah. can ask whatever you want. Yes, uh, Peter, thank you very much for 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 the presentation. It was uh, really inspiring, and uh, I, I would like to to share some uh, some thoughts very fresh new uh, just just after the presentation uh, which appears to be the usually uh, are the re real ones um, the I was a little bit um, dazzled and confused when it started over because uh, it was um, we, we, we are selling services quite all of us quite specialized services uh, all dealing with technical issues and uh, with the uh, highly professional customers uh, driven by technical solution and money wise so sometimes I was a little bit you know um, about the branding inspiring Apple story it was so nice but then something uh, came uh, very strong to me uh, when you explain to us uh, the, the, the difference from uh, that was between commu um, commodity up to experience. Uh, that's something that made me uh, really, really think about because uh, what we try to do in this period, all of us, uh, we, where physical relations are uh, digital um, with customers, uh, the only thing you can really rely on is to build uh, a real connection and base it on the experience that you're selling, yes. even if we are speaking about transporting a heater or a transformer or whatever, uh, it will always be between you and the other guy on, on, the, other, on the other part of the phone. That's... Uh, so thank you. I mean, really, thank Unless you. I think, I think this is something that we, that, that, that we sometimes tend to forget, that at the end of the day, we're dealing with other human beings. We may be dealing with highly technical uh, issues. We may be dealing with, with, with issues which the decision is finally very much a financial one and a capability one. But that human connection in the process is so important. It is so important. By the way, that's something that we have emphasized with Oceanco, 
Ocean Co in many ways is the same kind of process. You know, building a yacht is a very technical thing. It's a very technical thing. And there's an ecosystem that a buyer will work with. He's got his designer, he's got his representatives, he's got, he's got all sorts of people around him, right? And what yard he uses is very much a capability and a financial issue. But with the right connection, it becomes a much easier decision to make. That's it. Thank you again. <laughs> If I may, uh, I, I also have a, a question to Blanca Kleissens, and I'm really sorry that my... Uh, hey, Blanca. Can't see you. It's not working. No, I know it's not working. I, I don't know why. It, I have, it's not an apple, but it's not working either. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there comes directly my, my, um, my question and my uh, problem, let's say, today, because normally we interact with clients uh, by by meeting them, by inviting them to to job sites, by um, going for dinner, by getting into the office, and 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 we get connections through the eighty or ninety percent by which we are uh, used in communicating by seeing each other, by hearing and feeling, and and all those things that nowadays we cannot do, and so I have a big big problem in finding. Uh, new customers these days existing customers it's not a problem we share experiences and things like that and you you keep the the everything going but new customers um i i have no clue these days since covid how how to approach them how to to yeah. pass this the, what what we normally do yeah what would you recommend us there my recommendation again is to really search for your why not the what you do. The what you do is generic. The why you do it is what differentiates you. Okay. For example, I'll go back to Ocean Co for a second. Ocean Co is all about the perfect yacht can only be the perfect yacht when it is the owner's perfect yacht. There's a why inside there, right? We're not saying we are uh, the world's best super yacht builders. No, we're saying something else. We are completely obsessed with making your perfect yacht. So I would suggest that we need to look for our why, but it's got to be a relevant why that really resonates and clicks with customers on a human level. That would be my suggestion. And, and how do you pass that why then these days? It, practically how do you how do you how do you pass that message practically these days because you, you, you know to me the most important the most powerful way of passing messages on these days is by doing things that people like talking about we're living in a very very interactive world we're living in a very interactive world when we come across something which has created an impression on us, we tend to talk about it in today's world. To me, that's the most powerful way to do it. The most powerful. Okay. By the way, it's the positive part of the United Airlines story that I showed you earlier, which is the negative part of word of mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello, I have a question. Peter? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your nice presentation. It was uh, brilliant. I really love it. And it was really helpful. Uh, my question is, uh, um, we're talking here about brand, about communication. And, um, and I, I see that there is a difference between, uh, as you said, uh, communication at one part and what you really do. Because sometimes, uh, of course, you have a good marketing team that promotes you in a way that the company is not doing. And from the other side, uh, we see more and more, I don't know if it's right or not, but we are trying, at least at our company here in Brazil, Fox Brazil, we are trying to be more like humans or normal people that want to communicate and want to participate on projects. Not, we're not moving pieces, we're participating on projects for a better, better life. Uh, let's say we're... Uh, transporting a transformer for a bio 
few energy uh, projects yeah. somewhere in the world. So that's what we are trying to communicate, but not always we get, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, not the recognition, or but not always the communication is really passed to, to, to the customers because at the end, uh, uh, something that I was talking to Elizabeth, they want to see that you are active, that you are doing and that you are good. But uh, so my question is, what, what is the most uh, uh, practical way to, to achieve uh, the, the value on your brand? Keep in doing yeah. what you believe only and maybe some customer will respect and do attend or just having a good marketing team uh, communicating as uh, the, yeah. the, the trends. Uh. That's an interesting question, Warila. I, I really believe that it all starts with making sure that we've communicated internally, that we've got a very strong belief system internally. This to me is the starting point because I always say brand starts inside. Okay, because how many people work inside your company, Marina? Uh, 50. Okay, everybody communicates in everything that they do every single day. Somebody once said, right, the way you answer the telephone communicates brand. Absolutely true. And I think that if you've got a powerful, consistent internal culture, it starts to be expressed in everything you do. The role of marketing in today's world, in my opinion, is to amplify this, right? But it's got to start internally with a mindset thing. You've obviously got skill sets, you've got technical capabilities, you need a mindset capability and to turn that into a culture that everybody understands internally. And then we need to amplify it. Yes. And also the human resources is also something very important because you need to, to bring, like uh, I, I'm sure at Apple, they bring people that loves, loves the, 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 the products and they really want to be part of this company. And, and that's something that we have to, to bring, but also to make it real because otherwise people go, oh, it's not the same as I was, I was seeing on LinkedIn that you are so human and at the end you just... Uh, Yes. participate on a project that you yes. bring a lot of pollution to a river next to the project so yeah. uh, what you really are doing and what how we how we can manage also the human resources to yeah. services or let's say talking about yeah. heavy lift or uh, logistics that how you can uh, guarantee that people will engage on that culture and that's really true and then you communicate really properly to the market uh, so they can yeah. give value to your product or to your service instead of uh, okay i just want a better freight from China. No, I don't know. Oh. Correct, correct, correct. I also okay. think another challenge for you guys as a group is to get a is to make sure that you've got an internal consistency uh, amongst yourselves and between yourselves in terms of culture and cultural expression. Because at the end of the day, you're all sitting under that same logo, the heavy lift group, which is a very important thing. And I think that to have a consistent culture across the entire group is, is an important thing. Yeah, also uh, Peter, when, when involve, sorry, and when involve also different cultures, now because uh, we have at, uh, for example, at XCOM, we have uh, from Brazil, France, uh, Holland, Greece, and, and USA. And at the group, you have uh, still uh, 50 different countries and how you can manage uh, uh, to keep the values and to yes. also guarantee that they are paying, they're getting uh, something back from, from the, what yes. they invest on that uh, the time and the money. So it's not easy to, uh, uh, right, to home. <laughs> yeah. And I'm guessing that your business base is very much a global business base, which means that to have a very solid global culture is, is a very important thing. It's a very important thing. different campaign and I remember going to the UK and to just to make sure the campaign would work in the UK 
And the people at Apple in the UK said to me, you can't say that in England. I said, why not? They said, it's grammatically incorrect. They'll kick us out of the universities. It should be think differently. I went to Japan and the Japanese said, it'll never work in Japan. I said, why not? We all want to be the same. So I went back to New York and I spoke with Steve Jobs. And you know what he said to me? He said, screw the Brits, screw the Japs. That's how we speak in California. At some point, you've also got to make decisions. That's the way we speak at the heavy lift group, if you know what I mean. Otherwise, you lose your character completely in the process. Hi, Peter, I if I may ask a question. Humanly universal is terribly important. <coughs> terribly important. Humanly universal. Sorry, Tanya. No problem. Um, we found that our- I hear a South African was... accent, right? Yay! Yay! How's it? Peter, we found that our biggest problem with marketing is our customers undercut the prices. Yeah. They go to whoever is the cheapest. They don't yeah. care about service. They don't care about all the extra stuff we build in that's costing us a huge amount of money. Yeah. Um, they just want to get the cheapest load, even if it takes them three weeks longer. How yeah. do you go? How do you yeah, prove to them Tanya, they there's need all, us? There's always going to be a customer who's going to look for that and just go for it. Yeah. But I think that our task is to show people the value of what we do. And but the how way do that you do that? It, it goes how, back to how do you show it goes back to culture what it is that we stand for. I'm gonna give you another Apple example, and I'm sorry, I keep going to consumer products, but the same principles apply because we're all humans, right? This phone over here cost me 1,800 euros because it's an Apple 12 Pro Max, okay? There's a Samsung equivalent, which costs something like 200 euros. Now, my friends who are tech geeks tell me that the Samsung is maybe better than this. I don't care. It's not Apple. Because I like the culture that this brand represents. I like okay. this brand's narrative. Now, I know that we're selling a very different kind of service. I know that. But there are human beings who are making decisions. Let's, let's never forget that. Okay. Thank you. I'm Thank sorry, you. this is not, I, I don't want to just try to come up with an easy answer. I understand the difficulty of what we're talking about, right? But I think the principle is the same. I think that uh, for um, Tanya's uh, question, this not... better than them yeah, yeah 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 and we are yeah 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 of course you are. because i'm from heavy lift ah uh, okay anybody else yeah uh peter maybe um uh, maybe you can leave uh or your contacts or say how we can get a like a proposal if you like to make some uh marketing with you how it works how uh, how is the the practical thing i will send an email to you and then we get a, a proposal uh, what yeah. kind of information you need and so we can well maybe you have uh, some international customers here that might be interested on your services yeah i'd be delighted to uh to uh to talk to you guys about that i think what what i can do is to maybe what i'll do is i'll send you guys an outline of how i work so that you guys get a sense of what i do and what the result is of what i do um, basically i look for that narrative right 
that combination of ambition, DNA, and market insight, which gives us that sweet spot, right? That's really what I do. Um, so what I think I'd like to do, I very much appreciate that, is to give you a short document just outlining what I do. Thank you for that. Thank you. One, one question, uh, maybe, I don't know if anybody else has something. How important is for us, uh, you know, transport guys, uh, very practical, very, you know, uh, you know, you, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. How important is for us to have a marketing team in our companies? Well, I think it's absolutely crucial. If we, let me just step back and tell you why I'm answering like that. We're living in a world of extremely rapid change. Extremely rapid change. I mean, I find it very difficult and I live with consumer insight. It's part of what I do on a daily basis. I find it very difficult to predict what tomorrow is going to look like. Extremely difficult. Okay. And if I then extend my thinking and I say to myself, okay, I'm in your shoes and I live in a world where digital printing is on the horizon, 5G is on the horizon. What does all of this stuff mean to your business tomorrow? And it sounds like science fiction, but it's not. And then I think about the changing behavior of humans, right? which to me is probably the most volatile aspect of it all, because every impact of technology, of health threats, etc., etc., finally impacts consumers. And I come to the conclusion that if we don't have a good feel of what's happening in the markets and how to communicate in the markets, you can't deal with change. So in answer to your question, I think that being today, and I'm not going to use the word consumer focused or customer focused, I'm going to use the word human focused, is a big issue. We have to be human focused. We have to be. In a world of environmental concerns, of technological challenges, of new technologies arriving, of health concerns, we must be human focused. And that to me means being marketing focused and adapt the changes i mean the, the change in general as fast as possible that's what i understand yeah. but then again we are not you know we're we're obviously not coca-cola we're not apple we are uh, some of us are small some of us are bigger um companies who are you know doing our best to deliver in these difficult times that we go through so definitely it's not easy to invest in a, in a small team of uh, one, two, three people doing marketing. So uh, what about uh, if, if you had to choose one way to approach, would that be social media? Would that be advertising in uh, you know magazines of your industry? What would it be? I think that my you know, my the, the, the advice that I would that I would leave with you guys is to use number one, our combined strength as the heavy lift group, because we've got a big global presence sitting right here on the screen in front of me right now. And I would focus on the universal challenges facing humanity and this planet because they affect all of us. OK, and I would make sure that we are all plugged into what those changes look like and that we've all got a sense of the universal human needs that exist today, applying best practice that we can learn between different markets. OK, I am reluctant to say that I think that social media is more important, for example, than advertising in a specific trade magazine might be. Um, I don't know, but I do know that at the end of the day, the most important thing is how we behave on a daily basis. That I'm sure about. That is the most important thing, because that gets amplified in media, no matter which media it is. 
But I think your combined strength is what you should really be leveraging. And it is also one of our uh, slogans, power in unity. Yes. He's in <laughs> Yes. And you've got tremendous power. What I'm looking at right now is tremendous power. Even Pretorius represented. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know if there are any other questions, maybe for uh, Peter. I don't know if there is a chat area here. There is one more question in the chat box, uh, Elizabeth, from Mr. Oh, Richard Lee. I've got it. Richard Lee, yes? Yes. I echo Tanya's thoughts. Unfortunately, consumers don't buy experiences, iPhone or Starbucks via tenders process. My question is how marketing could help us when in most case, when most clients have strict tender processes. You're totally right. You're totally right. Except that I do think that over time, we can influence what good looks like and what good feels like. I don't think that you can influence a tender process in, in, in that kind of way tomorrow. But I think over time, you can influence what good looks like. And I think that should be your objective. I don't think there's any quick overnight solution, is what I'm saying. I'm seeing a very heavy lift here. <laughs> By the way, you might have a super yacht builder as a client somewhere because I think that they ship hulls from one place to another and they're pretty big, heavy things. Do you? Wow, what happened? Brazilian experience. Wow. Yes, uh, sorry, I was uh, just playing this video because, uh, yeah, sometimes it's, uh, I understand Patrick and uh, what Tanya said also about cost because all the time they are undercoating the cost and, uh, and you have at the end things can happen things like this. That's why we are the heavily wow. uh, group and experts because we are um, well specialized on projects, but not always the prices is, is an issue. So, and if you pay less, you get uh, this kind of things. You might get now. Sometimes you are lucky; they are lucky, and they. Uh, but yeah, it's hard to convince customers that the problems like this can occur. No? This is unbelievable. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that we can that, that we can sell ourselves in the same way that Starbucks sells itself. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying, let's not forget that it's people who make decisions. And if we focus on those people, we will find out some new buttons, hopefully. I'm not saying that we should become like consumer marketers tomorrow. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying let's really be obsessed with customers and customers are humans. Maybe we should show some people videos like this or find a smart way to do it. Um, I think that uh, what uh, uh, Patrick and I agree totally um, means here is that sometimes when we take part in, uh, in an RFQ, in a tender, we need to squeeze everything in a small Excel cell, yeah. you know, put a price that comes out of some services are per tone, some services are per hour, some services are per day. You know, you have to make some imaginary scenarios in your head and propose something that you can squeeze all these different prices and, um, you know, initiative and all the things that we talked about, vision, why and everything to go on that small cell. But the answer to that, at least for me, would be that, everybody puts the price in that cell so it's not only you it's also your competitors but what ca what comes later is that if you get shortlisted they invite you for an interview and that's where you can show why yes. you do it who you yes. are and yes. why uh, you can inspire people that they can trust you with your business that the uh, worth millions you know of uh, dollars or euros at, at least that's my experience and that's that's how I see it. I think that makes tons of sense to me. By the way, something comes to mind. We used to think of brand as added value. In other words, 
here is my service or my product and I give it added value through clever advertising and slogans and stuff like that. I want to just take that model and say that's not what we're talking about, right? I think the model that I'm talking about is very, very different. It's here's my product or my service, right? And there are foundational values underneath this which support what I do and why I do it, which make me a better person to deal with. That's what I'm talking about. And that's the definition of brand that Apple uses, that Starbucks uses. It's not about added value. It's about foundational value. Very big difference. Very big difference. I don't think the added value model is valid today, frankly, simply because mass media is not working the way that it used to work, simply because millennials are seeing through that kind of stuff. It's very different, the world today. It's a foundational value world. Who are you? What's your real character is what people are interested in. I see a suggestion in the chat area from uh, Ritesh. Uh, that's one way to leverage group strength is to have a THLG marketing team that can support each member with regional marketing activities. Yeah. Yeah. Food for thought, Murilo. <laughs> mm, I, have, I, have, I, have, I see here uh, Amanda, the group, maybe Amanda can pronounce. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good idea. Maybe uh, why not? Um, we can uh, discuss about it. Uh, Ritesh would be really nice. Uh, of course, we are, you know, we are uh, kind of uh, volunteers at XCOM. We, we still have to, to do our jobs uh, for heavy lift and logistics, but we could think and check uh, our budget. We feel we could manage to, to give a support to all members. It's a lot of work for sure, but uh, why not? It's a great idea, I think. So uh, thank Peter, you. Peter, do you yes. think that it is possible uh, to show our clients who we are uh, through a, a, a global group like the Heavy Lift Group? Would it be an idea to brand the Heavy Lift Group so that people um, everywhere they want to ship something, they, they search for a member of the Heavy Lift Group uh, because then that's what they want. Like you want the Apple, they want somebody from the Heavy Lift Group. Because yes, I think, I, think that's I think that's definitely something that you guys should should seriously consider. I would imagine that's already working for you. I would imagine. I would imagine it's the reason why you guys have got this group. Yes, or we do it internally reasons. because we, we know we can trust one another. So uh, I, we have no problem whatsoever to send the clients uh, which we cannot help in our country yeah. to a member for another country. That's why yeah. we are a, 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 a local, a global group of local professionals and, and we can trust one another. Um, but that's yeah. the internal strength of the group. I, I wonder how we can express that to, to all of our clients. Well, I think that one should start with the with all the vehicles that you use to communicate and make sure that you're expressing it in a very strong way, but that you've got a very strong narrative that you're expressing there. For example, your website, your individual website plus your group website should be very consistent in terms of its ethos to get back to that word, because Blanca, I agree completely with you. You want this global mindset with you said global and local, right? I would say ethos and logos, right? Where you've got a global ethos, but you've got a local logos, which is very, very powerful. But then you want all of this expressed very consistently with your individual websites, but also with the group website, for example, and all other media that you guys use. By the way, which are your primary media? I guess that web is a very important place where people find out about you, I guess. LinkedIn is our uh, number one uh, uh, media tool, LinkedIn. Sorry, could you repeat that, Elizabeth? LinkedIn. LinkedIn, okay. Yeah, that's our number one. And then, of course, we also have, uh, for THLG, we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Oh, there you go. There you go. 
we also do some advertising in uh, Alessio. Uh, would you like to? Yes, uh, we ha we have now uh, decided to to spread uh, to spread the word on the Heavenlift magazine, which is uh, uh, we 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 all have um, considered to be a very specialistic um, magazine and website uh, that goes um, into the mailing list of uh, almost everyone in the industry. So we have been uh, now decided to 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 advertise with some uh, full pages on the on the magazine and uh with uh some head uh in their in their website for certain periods of time for the next for the incoming year yeah yeah by the way is there a competitive group equivalent to yours within the industry there are many, but none as good as this one. <laughs> uh, if I if I may add, the, there are really really many multiple choices, uh, huge number of groups. Uh, everybody everybody is uh, the, the the main difference between uh, ourselves and the others. Uh, I can say that uh, we are totally um, all, all, all the money of the members stay in nobody is getting uh, advantage uh, personal advantage there is not a, an organizing company that is making money out of this uh, everything we do we do for the members and uh, it, it's 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 a real no profit and uh, we so are it's really like a club of, of the members yeah, right? yeah there is nobody that is handling that. Yeah. for money nothing yeah. nothing like yeah. that this yeah. makes uh it's a tweak because uh everybody is uh, in the other groups uh they look for new members because it's new membership fees and uh getting bigger and bigger and bigger we yeah. don't like to uh, we don't like to get that big we just like to be um uh, real connected that that's yeah. what I think we want to uh, to sell in terms yeah. of group. Yeah, so that you truly become a global, a globally empowered, global conscious, globally conscious group of individual members. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, Peter. By the way, we don't want to sell it uh, because uh, more members mean could means for us more administration. Not that yeah. we are not willing to grow. But we are want to to grow qualitative, you know, uh, yeah. and that's yeah. the big difference. We just want trustful partners that we can share uh, about a strategic project. Uh, let's say to build yeah. a, a hydropower plant in in Australia, and we will be sure that we have the right members that we can trust. We can share information, and we can go yeah, for yeah, that yeah. project. So it's a long that term. Makes a lot of sense. So you want to yeah. grow qualitatively. Yeah. Yeah, and and actually, what makes for me and uh, for many of us makes a huge difference is that if you are uh, one thousand members, you are one thousand emails. N now that we are fifty, sixty, or seventy, we know each other in person. Yeah. That that goes back to the human beings you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. know each other. We, yeah. we 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 can speak about friendship before them business yeah that's important stuff very important stuff especially in today's world i find especially in today's world very important stuff so the purpose of the group would uh, merely be to, to have the, the the right members and then uh, together have or be able to to serve uh, the 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 right clients and I, I think I, I everybody shares uh, the feeling of Tanya when we say that it's complicated these days and that they reduce uh, our offers to just uh, the numbers at the bottom right uh, of the page um, but if we explain uh, as much as possible what we do and especially why we do it as you said before um, then if they choose 
the price, well, then I think we will not be able to to make them change, except if they have a bad experience, like uh, the video of Murilu, <laughs> and then maybe these are not the 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 clients for for the group. But the, the purpose of the group is to to have also the the clients that 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 fit our vision somehow. You know, Bianca, what you've just mentioned is also terribly important is to make sure that you've defined what kind of clients are heavy lift group clients. That's terribly important. Mm. Because at the end of the day, you can't be you can't be everything for everybody. Your profile is going to be more attractive to a certain group of clients. And I think that you've got to really focus on that kind of that kind of client. I think that's important. Mm. And that's, that's uh, gonna, I would like, see we can I would like to add from my side also. Natalia? Yes, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, first of all, thank you for today's masterclass. But as a group, we normally do not compete to another group. As Elizabeth said, there are many groups like that. But when we uh, fight for business, uh, normally we don't compete against another group. Yeah. We compete about top 10, top 20 uh, freight forwarders of the world. Usually yeah. the companies who are huge, like Apple or Starbucks, but in logistics business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, while we are small or medium-sized companies, and um, being together gives us a competitive advantage when we uh, compete against such giant companies. So yeah. this is the main like uh, idea behind uh, this group. In this respect, I would like to ask you a question, whether you know in our industry, I don't know, maybe it will be difficult for you to ask, but in our industry, transport logistics, or maybe freight forwarding, do you know a company who is close to being ideal in marketing and branding? Who no, th I... you think do something right in this respect? Yes. You know, my experience, the closest experience I've got to your business, frankly, is the shipping business. And my sense has always been that the shipping business are not terribly good in marketing, frankly. Um, and that's the closest my experience goes. Um, some are better than others but i get the sense that they're not terribly good but i don't I, I don't have any direct experience close to your business no which by the way i think highlights an opportunity that you guys have got especially because you are small okay as you've just pointed out right you know each other you can really get a powerful ethos going between you you can generate a powerful why between you which goes beyond the what of the business. Because I get the sense it's very much a what driven business. Okay, now imagine a powerful why suddenly emerging within all of that, a powerful and relevant why. I, I think it's a powerful opportunity there for a group speak, of people uh, who know each other. If we speak about shipping industry, uh, if we speak about shipping industry, uh, recently uh, what happened in Suez Channel, um, you know, this um, ever giving ship, yeah. um, it took six days to refloat it again, and yeah. there were many uh, there were many experts saying it could be done faster. So it definitely ruins uh, the image of Evergreen yes. shipping line. Yeah. Do you have any like? Do you have any? Mm, advice uh, how should the company uh, act in this respect it happened already we saw in uh, Murilo's video that it may happen even to very professional companies uh, or to global players yeah. it happened many times to companies like DHL like I, I can name many of them yeah. so it happens so yeah. what should we do if uh, if such a situation takes place? I tell you, that is a very, very difficult question to answer in generality. But, you know, crisis, crisis management is probably the most important challenge that any company's got. I've been involved in a couple of crises in the past 
One that comes to mind is the Perrier crisis. And this might seem far removed from your business, but there are lessons inside there. What they did was they acted fast and very, very decisively. What they did is they withdrew every single bottle of Perrier from the shelves around the world overnight. I don't know if you remember that crisis, but they found some contamination in a Perrier bottle somewhere in the world. And this ran the risk of damaging the brand because at the time Perrier was saying, we are Earth's first soft drink, completely natural, completely clean, etc., etc., etc. The reaction was phenomenal. Okay. Crisis needs really very strong, decisive action. And there's no doubt that what Evergreen did in the Suez was not the way to do it. And I think the shipping industry generally, every time, you know, shipping really goes through a bad time every time there's a crisis, when you think about it. We don't think about ships until somebody blocks the Suez Canal. We don't think about ships until there's an oil spill. Then the whole world thinks about ships for a couple of days. And then we forget about them again, which is crazy, but that's the way it is. So my answer to you is, Difficult thing, you got to, you've really got to act very fast, very decisively, very strongly in a crisis situation. Oh, thank you, Peter. Of course, Kylis, I see there's another Greek here. Yeah. Yes, you can, Yako. Okay. Yeah. Καλησπέρα, τι κάνετε καλά. Πώ είσαι καλά. Μια χαρά, εσεί. Ενδιαφέροντα, Κυριακό, αυτά που ακούσαμε. Ναι, σίγουρα είναι κάτι διαφορετικό από αυτό που έχουμε συνηθίσει. Αλλά σίγουρα οι εποχέ αλλάζουν. Ναι, αλλάζουν. Αλλάζουν. Sorry, but we just speak with Peter in Greek. I told him that it's far away from what we have usually do in webinars about shipping, but new trends of marketing should include also this in our job. We can sit here and listen to you for hours and hours, Peter, but I think Murilo... Well, let's all order dinner and just sit here for hours. No problem. What time is right now in Greece? Okay, so... It is 5.08. 5.08. So you can start. Okay. Okay, Peter. So thank you very much for your time. It was really a pleasure for all of us here. We were really like uh, it was brilliant, and 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 as Kriako said, it's different from our day to day. So we really appreciate your time, and um, maybe later we can talk to to together to Elizabeth and see how we can work together as a group, as the Heavens group, or to share your contacts to all of okay. the members if they yes. would be interesting to interested to know more about your services and well thank you very much all the, the members from different it's parts of the world for being there and uh, it was a pleasure thank you very much and we see uh, each other in 15 days i believe i will have the our conference so be ready we have some votes also so we, we appreciate your presence there so thank you very much again thanks peter again it was thank you very much indeed Thank you for inviting me. All of you. Sure. Not since Tanya. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. 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 Bye.